Record better audio anywhere with Motive Digital Microphones from Shure. Easy to use options like the MV88 plug directly into your phone or computer and include a free app. Create studio quality sound for podcasts, music, and videos. Visit Shure.com to learn more. <laughs> Blog Talk Radio. Blackstone's music is a cross between rock, jazz, folk, blues, metal, and some pop thrown in for fun. The Dallanaga, Georgia native credits his unique sound from music legends ranging from Bach, Radiohead, Ed Sheeran, and even Tool. The multi-talented 22-year-old's eclectic taste in music also shows itself in the instruments he plays. The piano, guitar, bass, and cajon. He is literally a one-man band. Put on your seatbelt and get ready for a joyride. Mark Stokes is the new artist to keep your eye on in 2014 and beyond. Oh, I feel... I've known you forever oh. He really wants you to know that he is tackling this as a career and he is interested in traveling to any location so you can hear him live. Visit his website www.markstokesofficial.com and you can follow him on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I said a thousand times that you look just fine Ladies and gentlemen, this is your host, Yvonne Mason, and once again, you are joining us tonight on my show, Off the Chain, and those of you who have been with me since day one and have listened to my shows understand that sometimes it can really go off the chain. If you missed the show last night, it is in archives. The industrial band by the name of Cypher out of London, Ontario was my guest, and it was absolutely amazing. You don't want to miss this wonderful band. Tonight's guest is another friend of mine who is also an author who has been on this journey with me for going on nine, ten years. Yes. We met many, many, yes, we met many, many years ago. Uh, when we all, a group of us, got burned by a nefarious publisher who we do not mention his name because karma will get him. But she has been with me, and we have helped each other, and I have watched her grow. And, and it's it's been an interesting journey. And her name is Fran Orenstein, and she is the founder of Sunwriter, a multifaceted writing project. And this award-winning poet and writer wrote her very first poem when she was eight years old. She submitted a short story to a magazine at 12 years old and has continued to write professionally and academically and is the published author of fiction novels for, are you ready, ladies and gentlemen, children, tweens, teens, adults, and also poetry. She also gives workshops and hands-on presentations for publishing and free verse poetry. Dr. Orenstein has won awards for her poetry and short stories from the Florida Poetry Society and the American Association of University Women. She has been a member of a number of national and local organizations, including Sisters in Crime, National League of American Pen Women, the Florida and Arizona Poet Society, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, writing newsletters for several of these groups. Now, just as a little history about my friend Fran, she grew up in New York, in Brooklyn, and the Bronx, and she had a childhood that was filled with culture and outstanding educational opportunities. She raised three beautiful children and now is the proud granny of four grandchildren. She believes that volunteerism is as important part of living as a well-rounded life. She was a teacher, a magazine editor, a writer, a counselor. She managed women and children's programs, including child care, violence prevention, gender equality, and disabilities, and was an officer with the New Jersey AmeriCorps. She has presented workshops and papers at national and international conferences and wrote and managed grants, created, edited, and wrote numerous newsletters for government and community organizations, and she wrote political speeches and promotional materials. Not only that, this fine young woman has a bachelor's degree in early childhood education, 
a master's degree in counseling psychology, and a doctorate degree in child and youth studies, hence the title doctor. Retired from the stresses of this workplace, she writes novels and award-winning short stories and poetry, and then gives presentations and workshops on writing prose and poetry. Are y'all interested yet? Because I know I am. And with that being said, we are going to welcome Dr. Fran Orenstein. Welcome, Fran. Well, thank you so much, Yvonne. Your words are so kind. <laughs> yes, they're so true. I was sure they it was are... about somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all you, my friend, all you. Um, well, thank you. And we do go back a long way, yes, indeed. <laughs> Yes, we do. And when we first started, correct me if I'm wrong, but when we first started, were you just doing children's book point or had you gone into the – I remember one of the first books I remember is The Ghost Under Third Base. Yeah, that has been – yes, I was doing children's books originally. That is really my favorite age group. Um, I love children's mysteries. I always love children's mysteries from the time I was little. This may age me, but um, my first uh, my first experience was the Bobsy Twins, and then of course um, Nancy Drew, which is still going strong. So I've always loved mysteries, and my mother was a mystery reader. So I think I grew up at the library in mystery <laughs> in the mystery section. <laughs> But, um, yes, you're right, it was. And the Ghost Under Third Base has been, is is now in its fourth iteration, I must say. Oh, my uh, goodness. Yes, I think it's got, had four publishers or three publishers already. But now it is a series. It's um, the, In fact, we were talking earlier about my uh, going into rewrite and editing for a fourth book in the series, which publishers has been... <sighs> bugging me to get out for the past year, and I'm finally hoping to get it to her by the end of this month or the beginning of next month. So um, that is a uh, a tween, middle grade um, right. series for mysteries with an ongoing, a single ongoing character through the uh, series. And the other one that I remember was about the young girl who thought she was too fat, fat girls from outer space. Yes, yes, definitely. I I love that book. That is a very special book to me, uh, Explain Fat Girls from that Outer book. Space. Explain that book to our listening audience because this, ladies and gentlemen, this book has a beautiful life's lesson in it and I want Fran to explain this book and how it came to be well it came to be because I was a fat child and I was well at that time there was they didn't call anything bullying they called it teasing making fun of it was humiliation you know it's it's a terrible thing for a child to be different and to have to grow up with people calling you names and making fun of you and being embarrassed in gym class and, you know, uh, in other places where you, you can't compete. And uh, it has gotten worse today because of the um, obsession with thin. Everything has to be thin, thin, thin. And um, Fat Girls is simply a story of 12, a 12-year-old, going, and she becomes 13 in the book, um, who I named, her name is Frederica, I call her Freddie, and she's uh, she's a fat girl, and she has thin friends, you know, but she has, there is one boy in her school, her middle school, who who bullies her, makes her life miserable, and uh, it's how she takes a special talent that she has meets two other girls who are also fat girls. And they have that talent, and the three of them get together, and they become famous in the town. 
And so they managed to overcome their physical problems by using their talents. And this does not necessarily mean it can it should be only read by fat girls <laughs> or fat boys because very skinny kids have the same problem. A kid with a with something anything different about their body. That's true. And and you know how kids are at that age. You know the zit. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, the, the, the end. Zit. Life has just ended. <laughs> Right, <laughs> life as we know it is 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 gone. Will never be the right. same. Yes, the uh, the uh, the bad hair day. You know, oh my that's, God, <laughs> that's the end of the world. Or, or my or hair clothes. is curly and theirs is straight. Or it's mine is red and I have freckles, as one of her friends says. You know, so. Um, so but this, it's, it's yeah. This Go ahead. book. This book could be cathartic for a child. Yes, yes, because it deals with bullying, it deals with standing up for yourself, but it also deals with learning how to overcome and grow and be beyond and go beyond that bullying. Does it deal with learning how to accept yourself and understand that you are enough just the way you are? It does because she's able to use her talent to realize that she's a, a, a brilliant, wonderful, talented girl, and her and lo, and what she sees in the mirror is not her. It's what she. It's what's inside. That makes perfect sense to me because we all. I know for years and years and years, I, I didn't feel worthy. I didn't feel like I was good enough for anything. And mm-hmm. it took me a long time to understand I'm okay just the way I am. And and those that refuse to accept me for the way I am, maybe they have flaws that they're not comfortable with, so it's easier to bully someone than it is just to say, okay, I've got flaws, you've got flaws, but together we're pretty great. I always wanted to be somebody I wasn't, and in the end I wound up not being true to myself. So Fat Girls from Outer Space is along that same line. And it's also a matter of coming at it so that anyone who bullies someone and reads this realizes what they might be doing to another person. Good point. And, and, because yeah. Because, because anybody can be bullied, and nowadays you can do it quietly on the net, unfortunately. That's true. That yeah, on very, the web, very, very whatever you call it. <laughs> um, it's yeah. the thing that we love. Um, tell me about, because some of these books I didn't even know you had out there, and they Wait, can I make a plug for Fat Girls? Yes, it, ma'am. The publisher can. also put it out as a graphic novel. It's a great graphic novel. So Excellent. that's just. Yes, and they're both on 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 sale on Amazon and other online places. So check out so what the graphic novel looks like. It's really neat. So your Beautiful. reader not only gets to, to to read it, they get to visualize it. Absolutely, yes. That's perfect. Yes. Very well done. I'm sorry I interrupted you, but I have to throw a plug no, in there. No, no, I'm glad you did because I did not realize you had put a, put a graphic novel out with that book because that is a neat, neat little book. Well, I the, love this publisher I have for children's books, and she's, she's just great about doing things like this to enhance the books. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. And while we have a break in this, if you want to call in and ask Fran a question, please do. The number is 516-387-1756. This is Off the Chain. I am your host, Yvonne Mason. And my guest tonight is the one and only, the wonderful author, Dr. Fran Orenstein. Now, tell me about these new books that I was I'm ashamed of myself. I did not know that they were out, and they I might even have to read them, even though they're kids' books. The Shadow Boy Mysteries. What yes, is that? That's the, the segue from the original Ghost Under Third Base. It is now called The Mystery Under Third Base. 
The second book is The Mystery of the Green Goblin, and the third book is The Mystery of the Stolen Painting. And the fourth book that I am finishing now, I'm finished, but now that I'm working on um, honing, <laughs> is uh, The Mystery in Graham's Attic. So, and does the same theme run through the entire series? Uh, the same character, the mysterious character, Willie. Uh, I'm sorry, the mysterious character, Hubie. Um, and it's a secret how I conceived him. The kids don't know what he is, but he disappears when he, can, when he wants to. He reappears. Um, he knows things he shouldn't know. He helps the kids when they need help. He's a little boy. He's a boy. He's their age. Right. And and uh, it's all for you know uh, tween and middle grade age age groups, so the kids range from twelve to thirteen or four thirteen yeah, and uh, mostly twelve year olds. But uh, Hubie appears when the main character in each of the books needs help. When something's going on in the character's life that they can't cope with anymore, Hubie suddenly mysteriously appears. And I now, hope you'll be 12 again. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> because this, these sound so interesting. Well, I, I mean, adults have... read them. You know, people read, read them. It's not just, you know, kids who read them. They're not baby books. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're um, Right. I don't use baby language in any of my books, so they really have to try for it. But I've had seven- and eight-year-olds read them, and I've had teenagers read them, and I've had adults read them and enjoy them. So it's even though I say they're tween books, um, they're really for anybody. Well, that so. that segues into a question I wanted to ask you while I was doing my prep work on you and saw all these wonderful things you've accomplished in your life. How has doing these things, for instance, um, your degrees and your workshops, how have they helped you write stories like this? A lot. Well, there's a facility for language that you learn when you get an education. Um, there's also uh, you know, the degrees in psychology and child and youth studies, you know, gives me an, uh, a knowledge of child, child development and, what's, and where children are at certain ages and stages. So I get a, an idea of that. Um, I, also some, I also watch some of these programs on television to get an idea of how kids speak, although they're not really speaking the way they normally would on television, but like Ricky, Nicky, Dicky, and Dawn kind of, you know, right. um, shows like that. Uh, and it it just, it gives me an insight into what goes on in their heads and how they might behave and react. So did you know when you were um, studying your bachelor's degree in early childhood education, that it would lead to you writing children's books? Uh, well, I always knew I was right. I mean, I always wrote. It doesn't matter what I was doing. I was writing um, poetry mostly during those years. But, for example, when I was in my master's program in psych, uh, I took a cl- had to take a class in uh, adolescent uh, um pathology or psychology or however you want to term it. And uh the the teacher the professor asked the class and you know, it was a it was a, a lecture class. He asked us to write a paper on um deviant deviance in adolescence. Adolescent deviance. When I thought about that and I said, you know what, I'm not writing a research paper. So I wrote a short story called The Mutant, which is now published, which we'll talk about another time, is now published, <coughs> excuse me, in my adult short story uh, book, uh, Dance Macabre. It is a sci-fi story about 
a, a boy who's considered a mutant in the future. Mm-hmm. And he's in, it considered a deviant. And I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> right. Well, the professor loved it so much, he made me get up and read the entire story to the, to the lecture class, lecture hall. Wow. And he told me I should publish it. He gave me an A+. <laughs> um, he wanted me to publish it. My son, older son wanted me to publish it, but it took all these years to finally get it into uh, a short story. Um, I thought of making it a full-length novel, and then I said, well, it works so well as a short story, I don't want to ruin it by adding too much. So uh, it is now in Dance Macabre as one of the stories. But that's that's an example of what I'm, I'm I'm talking about. My choice of a bachelor's degree was not my choice; it was Mama's choice. <laughs> ah, there you yes. go. And Mama wasn't wrong, apparently. Well, uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'd much rather have been digging up the pyramids in Egypt, you know, as an anthropologist, archaeologist. But you know, that wasn't happening. <laughs> so. Um, so, what type of counseling did you do? Was it also with children? Um, no, um, 17 was the youngest. I was a vocational rehab counselor for eight years. I worked with people with disabilities. And uh, I, did, I did counseling, I did job placement, um, follow-up counseling for the job placement, and so on. And... Um, and then I continued my work with people with disabilities as I moved into other jobs because I recognized a terrific need, especially in the women's community. So I started a coalition on women and disabilities in New Jersey, which continues to this day. I mean, that was back in the mid-'80s. And, wow. Uh, they did a lot of legislation and bringing uh, hydraulic tables to doctors' offices and hospitals. You know, can you imagine someone getting out of a wheelchair and trying to get up on a table? I fight so it every time we go to the down. doctor's office. Yep. My mm-hmm. husband's in a scooter, and he can't stand. So, yes, I I can relate to that very, very well. It is impossible for him to get up on an exam table. Well, these this group managed to get a, a sample bed from pencil from a hospital in Pennsylvania. They had it brought to New Jersey, and they they brought it around to all the hospitals and the doctors' offices and so on, and that's how it got started. You are an amazing woman, Fran. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I just do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're an absolute amazing woman. Because okay. down here in Florida, and it's supposed to be one of the most advanced medical fields in the nation, I go to a doctor's office, and they'll say, can he stand it? And I look at him and go, really? He can't get up on that table. So if you're going to examine him, you've got to do it in the scooter. Well, either that or get a hydraulic table. Yes. There you go. And... <laughs> that I mean, will be my body. next. <laughs> that will be my next suggestion. Let's well, now little... you know why I'm living in Arizona and not Florida anymore. <laughs> Yes, ma'am, I do. (laughs) Let's talk a little bit about your teen and young adult books. Again, I did not know these were out there, and they just, they look wonderful. Well, Um, yeah, go ahead. No, you start. I just open the door. You go ahead and walk through it. Well, the Book of Mysteries is a, a, is a, it's three novels under one cover. So there are three separate novels in this one book, and they are for younger teens, older tweens. So kids, say, 11 to 15 would like them. They are fantasy adventures, three fantasy adventures, the same characters in each book, two boys from New York City, which is where, you know, I grew up, um, uh, and Tyler and Zach and and their adventures uh, in in a fantasy in fan, three different fantasy worlds, and I don't want to give it away, but um, you know they it's it's a family trait in Tyler's family, 
they go to their his father his uncle sends him to a disappearing bookstore in Manhattan and um and there is a magician who is the book bookseller and uh, through the book of mysteries they go on these adventures and uh they have to uh they have to fulfill uh you know fulfill something before they can return if they can return cuz sometimes it gets a little hairy <laughs> and so you know they're up against wizards and dragons they're up against um mythical beasts like the uh like centaurs and griffins and hippogriffs having a war um so it's um it gets to be uh, it it's it's interesting in each book you know they get older in each book and so by the third book they're interested in girls you know and so in each story each book has a female has female characters uh from the fantasy land do they, they ever not want to come back uh no <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to come back. <laughs> well, tell me about um, your historical romance and adventure for teens and young adults. Like the the two books that I'm looking at is The Spice Trader's Daughter and The Calling of the Fruit, Flute. I can't even talk. These yep. both look okay. so, so interesting. These are historical romance adventures. Uh, the Spice Trader's Daughter takes place between uh, 1685 and 1701, and it's the story of, of the Huguenots in France who were persecuted and had to escape and run away to, uh, well, a lot of them went to Konigsberg, which at that time was Prussia. A lot of them went to the Netherlands, and some of them went to New York and founded cities um like New Rochelle, New York. Of course that's a French a French word, uh French name. Um and it's the story of one family, the du- the Dubois family and uh several generations and uh and how the uh uh the daughter Katie, the third the second generation, she ends up back in France and she actually meets Louis the Fourteenth. It's very historically correct. Um and uh it's it's she falls in love and it's it's how she gets it unfortunately she and her her uh, lover you know her boy they, they weren't lovers but you know what i mean mm-hmm. um are embroiled in uh, political intrigue and they have to escape for their lives wow the second book is based on the story of and loosely, <laughs> of my my grandparents, particularly my grandmother, who was, uh, and it takes place in Lithuania in uh, the turn of the 20th century. So it starts in the late 1800s. Um, and uh, my my grandmother was a rebel. She rebelled against the religion and, um, you know, lost her one true love. And became a pariah in the in the small town that they lived in. It's also the story of persecution by the Russian Russians and the Cossacks, um, and uh, the the um, and and what they how they took boys little boys into the army, and they were never seen again. And it's her her and her brothers escaping. Also another escape um, adventure out of uh, Lithuania and to the United States. And a lot of it's true. And all these things did happen. Um, They may not have happened to my family, but they did happen. Um, My grandmother was a rebel. (laughs) So that part is true. (laughs) And so that's the calling of the flute, because my grandfather was a flutist in, in, uh, in, in Russia. So what you have done, you have basically taken history and made it interesting 
to a group of young people who might not necessarily enjoy history, but they learn history through the joy of reading. Yes, because it is a, they are fiction books. I mean, there are people in them, obviously, who, who actually lived, like Louis the, Louis the Fourteenth lived. You know, he mm-hmm. was real. And and uh, the kings and queens, you know, Louis and and uh, the kings and queens of Prussia, and um, in uh, in in spice in the calling of the flute, and these people actually lived them, and a lot of it is is was historical fact. You know, a friend of mine who probably is listening, I hope, <laughs> was uh, loves to do research, and she did a lot of research for me on some of these books. And um, and I did the rest of the research, and so uh, the books are historically correct, and the places are historically correct, but uh, the stories of you know basically, except for my grandmother's little piece there, you know, are basic, and my grandfather, basically his you know historical fiction. I love it. it didn't happen to somebody who actually, you know, that these things didn't actually happen. Of course they did. I absolutely love it because it gives children an insight into history and they learn without even realizing they're learning. And it will stay with them longer than if they just try to read it out of a history book. Mm-hmm. Even and though any, it's fiction. There's, yeah. Even though and it's any fiction. That they, that they don't quite understand or get, they can look up. You know, it's, a, you it's a great way for teachers to. It's a great, um, great learning way for for teachers. Well, I want to back up just a little bit and get you to um, tell our listening audience that not only do you do tweens, not only do you do teen and young adult, but you have some books even for the little guys, the eight to eleven range. And these books not only tell a story, but again, in words that these children these ages can understand, they t- they give a life lesson. Yes, and that is my Amber series. Um, One Amber, Too Many, Amber and the Magic Whipped Cream Dress. And the third book that is in the works eventually, <laughs> I mean, it started. It's a, a, a book that has been started called Amber Times Two, or Amber Plus Two, I can't remember the exact title. And it's the story of a nine-year-old girl, Gillian, whose father, parents are divorced, and her father remarries a younger woman. Gillian feels like she's her father doesn't love her anymore. And uh, I'll, I'll just read a little portion of the first page or so. Yes, okay. Absolutely. Chapter 1, Daddy, the Witch, and the Baby Doll. One month after her ninth birthday, Gillian Sandler ran away from home, but she only got as far as the back gate. She watched a lizard dart around the fairy duster bush. Lucky lizard, she said. Wish I could run away like you, but I can't eat bugs and sleep on the leaves. I have to carry a backpack with peanut butter sandwiches and water and clean underpants. She rolled on over and lay on her back, looking up at the or- as the orange sun moved behind the mountain and sank. Not fair, even the sun can run away. Fiery clouds streaked across the sky as if painted by a giant hand. A cloud that looked like a brontosaurus lumbered past in the wildfire sky. Run fast, brontosaurus, before the fire gets you Run, wish I could run across the sky. Gilly turned onto her side and curled up tighter, pulling her thin legs beneath her body. The ground was hard and poked painfully against her hip bone. But Gilly didn't care. She wanted to hurt. Pain dulled the awful thoughts that tumbled through her head. That's That's powerful. And what it is is she's just found out that her dad is going to remarry. And she is just devastated. But she tries her best to wreck everything. Wreck the, and everything she does backfires. So there's a lot of humor in it, too. 
And that's like, usually what, what happens. That's usually what happens when there is a divorce and a remarriage, either on the father's part or the mother's part. The children feel torn. They feel like if they love one, they can't love the other, or the parent doesn't love them because they're so wrapped Mm -hmm. up in this new relationship. And I think this is just an amazing, amazing series, Fran, because that is a great way to, to help a child work through something that is that traumatic. Yes, and in addition, and and I've told this to parents who have complained to me about the theme of the stories, these children are now surrounded by divorced families. If their family isn't divorced, their best friends is, or Uh their schoolmates are. I mean, we're talking, what, one out of two statistically? At least. Yeah, and so why shouldn't why shouldn't the child understand what someone's going through during that time, and what they're going through? And what the child why right? Yeah, because children don't always understand why they feel the way they feel because number one, they're too immature, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but they haven't been able to see everything that goes on behind closed doors in a marriage or what happens within the nucleus of the marriage because for many parents just put this face on in front of the children. Mm-hmm. So they're well, rocking addition, along thinking everything's fine and boom. Well, children are also, you know, into their own thing. They're, yes. they're, they're, yes, and and they don't think about what's going on around them until it hits them. And then it's a shock. Yes, yes. And then it's a double shock when one of the parents says, oh, I'm getting married again, welcome to your new step-parent, and this child is going, what? Who well, might so only I be a couple of, not that old, much older, you know. <laughs> right. So this yeah. is an excellent, excellent learning tool. I'm telling you, my friend, you have nailed it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You have given parents tools to help their children to succeed. You have given children tools to learn history in a fun-filled and exciting way. You have given children tools to learn how to deal with with life, with your um, mystery series. And you know what? I really believe that it it is your insight that you garnered from all the things that you have done during your life that comes out in your stories. Well, thank you. Thank you. I am very, Uh, very tickled and, and happy because... This this is amazing. If these parents don't buy these books for their children for Christmas and birthdays and just because, oh, my goodness, they're cheating their children out of such wonderful stories. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, you uh, introspection, so unfortunately, has not become been the watchword. It's, it's all quick visual flashes and that's it and well I th- they gotta read what what makes you want to write what what makes you get up in the morning to write um i just feel compelled if i have a book that's lying around that i haven't finished or worked on or something i'll have dreams Symbolic dreams um, about about unfinished things. Um, writing has always come very easy to me. I've tried everything. I've tried art. I've 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 done music since I'm seven. But writing, writing, just the idea of popping to my head, as though some muse is 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 playing with my brain, and I can do it at any time, anywhere. I don't have to worry about art supplies or or people shutting me up, you know, with the piano. <laughs> I can just write, um, and and writing 
is a very easy thing for me to do. It Sometimes it scares me because sometimes I can write a book in a month. It just flows right into my head as though someone were writing it or I was being, <laughs> that's the word I'm looking for, channeled. <laughs> that, that's the word you're looking for? As so though you're yeah. being channeled. Well, where do you get your ideas? Well, that's the whole thing. Uh, it's something, sometimes it's something I'll hear or I'll read about, but most of the time an idea just pops in my head and I'll develop it. I've got I've got lists of, of ideas for books um, that might not even ever happen. But um, that's why I like short stories, because you can write a lot of those. In a very short time. Yes, yes. Um, but that that's 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 me in writing and it's been the same way when I wrote from work and when I wrote academically. I'm just I have a knack to just be able to sit down and words flow right out. Do you um, ever get writer's block? Oh yes. For me, I get part way into a novel and I start to hate it. <laughs> oh, it's not never going heard. right. I'll never figure this out. I can't. It's slow. It's dragging. It's this. It's that. And I'm like, oh, forget it. But I can't let it go. And it takes a while to get past that. It's not that I don't know what to put down. It's just that I feel like, oh, what am I doing this for? <laughs> it's dragging along. It's monotonous. <laughs> It's like it's like being stepped on by an elephant's hoof, you know, <laughs> an elephant's foot. Um, I understand that. Yeah. But if you don't write, don't you feel like you're missing a part of who you are? I feel guilty. Yeah. I feel guilty because I, I have this gift and I'm not using it. And and they say if we don't use those gifts that we are given by God, we lose them. Mm-hmm. And we can't be losing your gifts because I'm going to tell you, this is just absolutely amazing. And ladies and gentlemen, not only does does Fran write all these wonderful young people, tween, young adult, teen, children, 8 to 11 books, she also writes adult books, which we're going to run out of time in about 15 minutes, and we're going to bring Fran back just to talk about her adult books because there's enough information here for these children's books that we could probably talk for about three more hours. Oh, when... Don't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> do you get bored I... if you don't have a variety to write about? Yeah, that's a big thing for me. I get bored with everything. I always get bored. And uh, I can't. I'm not a rote person. I don't enjoy. I wouldn't enjoy doing a a major series like there are some authors that can write 20 books about the same characters, right? Different plots, and I can't do that. I I don't I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy just writing in one genre. I like variety. I and understand. Mm-hmm. And now, uh, go ahead. But one thing I wanted to mention is I do, I did with him, the previous old publisher from way back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a book of poetry that was published, and then of course when that hap- all that happened, uh, the book you know was no longer available. But I have redone it, and I have. It's poetry for children. It's a children's poetry book, which is one of the things that I that really bothers me that people aren't doing anymore. I mean, my children grew up on a child's gardener verses on Winnie all the 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 A. A. Milne poetry books. You know, children's poetry is amazing. So I've added a lot of poems, and my son is. A, a professional Georgia magician, musician, as <laughs> your introduction talked about somebody, um, and he, and I wrote a I wrote a song based on one of the poems, and he 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 um, did an arrangement, and we taped it in his little um, his his uh, studio, 
And uh, so that's also part of this book. But the trouble is finding someone who's willing to take a chance on children's poetry, finding a publisher. We may, have to, we may have to put it out there in the netherworld and the right publisher will come along. Is this song out there anywhere or is it just part of the book? Um, I you know, it's I don't know if he put it out on iTunes. Uh I'll have to ask him. No, the song is one of the poems. Um so I, I wrote the poem, and then I wrote the music, and he did the arrangement, and he did the piano background, and I sang it, and we, we taped it in his in his studio. But I don't, I don't remember if it ever went out, um, if he ever put it up on iTunes. What, what I would like I, for you to do... I know what I'm do, doing with <laughs> so I wouldn't know what I was doing. Well, what I would like for you to do, if you can, or either get your son to do is send me the MP3. That's that's the way we send music back and forth now. And I will put it into my queue, and when I have you back on, that will be my introduction song for you oh. on that night. Okay. So that, so that people can hear it, and there are other places that your son, son, your son can load it. One of them is CD Baby. One of them is Verb a, Na- Verb a Nation, and he can load that song up and charge for it, and people just download the MP3 and they pay 99 cents or a dollar, and we can start promoting that song for you. Oh, neat. Okay. See, yeah, there's all cool. kinds. Of, uh, there's all kinds of ways that we can do, and I can play it on here the night that when we bring you back, as the like that was my nephew that we did the intro. That's that's my nephew out of out of the. Oh, office. okay. Okay. Yeah, I wrote it down. I was going to ask uh, my son if he knows him. So, uh, yeah. He might because he plays it all up in uh, Dahlonega, and he he graduated from Gainesville College with a okay. degree in music. But, yeah, well, um, it's the same kind of music Pete does. That's why I said it. he went to Berkeley College of Music. So this is a it's the same kind of music he does. That's why it, well, it, it he might know me. Mark then. He might. Is it K or C? It's a K. M A R K. Jokes. Okay. Oh, we'll ask him. But or if he's yes, online have, there, he may be listening. I don't know. He could be. But if you'll get me that MP3 and you can just have him send it to me at my email address, I'll add it to the queue and then we'll play it and then we'll discuss it before we discuss. And I'm not going to spoil the next show. People are going to have to tune in with all these other lovely, lovely little books for adults <laughs> that I, I don't see them. I'm just turning the page over because we're talking about the children tonight. <laughs> okay, okay. Sounds good to me. <laughs> um, What about telling our listening audience where your books can be found your website, how people can find you, because in in a, this technological age, people don't go to bookstores anymore. They use the Internet. I use the Internet for everything. And if they don't know where to find you unless they just stumble upon you, they won't know where you are. Fine. All my books are on online publishers with Amazon and on Kindle. Um, um yeah. <laughs> Are they on Barnes and Noble and Nook? Barnes and Noble? I'm sorry, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> Barnes and that's Noble. Quite all right. My, uh, if you just look under my name, all the books will come up. And uh, and my website is Fran Orenstein. www. Fran That's F R A N O R E N. dot com. Do you and have all the books covers. are in there under books, and also links are in there. See, there you are in my head, friend. Things don't change in 10 years, do they, my friend? <laughs> you knew what I was going to ask before I asked it. <laughs> in your books, in, in your children's books, are any of these characters based on some of the antics that your children did? Um. 
Uh, not really. No, the um, I'm trying to think now. Well, yes, I, I, I'm. It is and it isn't. Well, for instance, Pete, my son Pete, in, in Pete Orenstein in Georgia, he's he's a uh, he's a musician, but his and his instrument is piano. So yes, uh-huh. the piano is there. But I also played piano when I was a kid too. But he's a professional at it, so that that hit. Um, and um, no, not really, not really. So all of these children are your children through your imagination. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do they stay with you all the time? Some of them do. Yes, uh, Freddie does. You know, fat girls. She's always in my head because that's what me. That was me. <laughs> um, and the mystery books, I I just love. That's I just adore that. I love that age group. You know, the tween age group because they're just. They're so open to adventure, and they have this budding awareness of the opposite sex, but yet not. And uh, some, and two of the books have have girls in them too. You know, lead character girls as well as boys. And they're moving into a wider variety of genres. You're making discoveries about the world themselves. Everything is changing. You know, their view of the world is widening. So it's exciting to write for that age group. So I like that because, you know, they're pulling away from their parents and they're becoming independent. And that's when, uh, you know, that's when the wars start. So I guess some of the teenage wars, I guess, are in those books. You, know. you can't help it if you're a parent, you know, it's going to happen. That is uh, very true. When they say, I hate you, and you have to say, I love you enough for both of us. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I make it out. You know, but we'll see what happens when they say the same thing to them. (laughs) And they realize what a knife they stuck in their parent. You know. (laughs) Well, I used to tell my children, um, when you grow up, I hope you have children that is just like you. And what they felt, because and they laugh at me. Well, what they failed to realize is the curse does work. My mother used to say to me, I hope you have ten like you. <laughs> the curse works. <laughs> the curse worked. I only had three, but the curse worked. <laughs> no, I, I can't say that. I mean, I'm very, I'm very, despite whatever goes on in our family, in your know, family issues, which happens to everybody, I'm very proud of my children. I'm very, very proud, and I'm extremely proud of my grandchildren. And my granddaughter just started college. She's 17. Congratulations. And to Northwestern University. And, uh, in fact, uh, when we talk about the adults, her picture at the age of three is on the cover of Gaia's Gift. So. Wait. So yes. she's, she will be forever in, with, in perpetuity. In perpetuity, you are, yes. <laughs> you are an excellent grandmother. Um, what I always I ask all of my guests this because I feel like that it is important that they impart a few words of encouragement and wisdom to anyone out there that is looking to live a dream. So, in a, for about three minutes, if you can, impart your words of wisdom to someone who has a dream but doesn't know if they can live that dream. The only thing we really have is dream, are dreams. Most of us have not got the financial wherewithal the, or sometimes the support to, re, to realize our dreams, but you're not going to go anywhere in this world unless you have a dream. And do your level best to make that dream happen. And it may not turn out to be what you originally dreamed, but it doesn't mean it can't be as satisfying as when you dreamed it, as what you really wanted. You know, yeah, I'd like to be on the New York Times bestseller list and, you know, <laughs> have a uh, have, um, major New York publisher behind me. But even those authors are struggling now. Yes, you they are. You see them everywhere trying to sell their books. 
What did what did James Patterson get on TV? He says, "I'm gonna kill uh, who's his main character. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna kill him." <laughs> yep. He said, "If you don't buy the book, I'm gonna kill him." I'm gonna <laughs> kill, kill him right off. But that is so, true. Yeah, and the publishing world is not what it used to be at all because of the economy. And because of the 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 anthrax, I, I remember all the manuscripts I had out at the time went in the garbage, went in the trash. We didn't have the luxury of emailing mm-hmm. uh, manuscripts. Most most of the publishers didn't want them that way. They wanted them in in uh, you know snail mail. Yep. But they ended up in the trash. And then because of the economy, publishers started eating up other publishers until there were only five or six left. And all the others you hear about are imprints of those five or six. Imprints meaning rewards for editors who get, you know, good good authors and will make a lot of money. They get a special imprint. Uh, and, and, And I do have to say that this group of us, ladies and gentlemen, that have been together, and there is a group of us that have been together for about 10 years, we are the ones that broke the ceiling on indie publishing because we are the ones that made the Internet our friend. We are the ones that said we will control our destiny and we will be heard and we will publish our work. And like Fran says, we may not be on the New York Times bestseller list, but at the end of our day, we can say we do sell our work. We are successful. Am I correct, Fran? Yeah, and and just a dream. Be a published author, that was my dream. I made that dream. It happened. And, yes, the reason I have, I have publishers, and I do have three publishers, small publishers, but I have them because I'm not technically able to do it myself. And it's easier for me to have found a small publisher who does a beautiful job publishing my books. So, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have have followed this um, show, Off the Chain, every end of every show, I leave you with some advice. And that advice is, if you do not try, you have already failed. To have tried is to have succeeded. And if you allow someone else to steal your dream, then you have failed because no one can steal your dream without your permission. If you have a dream, it's like Fran says, if you have a dream, you go for that dream. And while you may have to make detours and while you may have to take a different path, the dream should always be in front of you. Because you are the only one that can make that dream real. You are the only one that at the end of your life, you have no regrets. You don't go saying, I should have, would have, could have. We're never too old. And, friend, correct me if I'm wrong. We're never mm-hmm. too old to be successful. And we're never That's too right. old to make a dream real. Is that a correct statement? That is absolutely correct, and I have one. As an A personality, I have to have the last word, never give up. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, we are getting towards the end of our show. uh, Wednesday night, my guest will be my friend, Sita Begee, who has her own radio station. She also is an entrepreneur. She has her own uh, beauty line. She is also a published author. She is one of 18 children. The night after that, another author friend of mine, Robbie Cox, will be on. So next week is just going to be full to the brim again. Fran, I want to thank you, my dear, dear friend, so much for the honor of being on my show. And we will get, we will get you set up for another hour so we can discuss the adult books that I just turned the paper over and not cheating anymore. So thank you, my sweet friend. Well, thank you, Yvonne, for having me. I really appreciate it. And everybody out there, if you're a writer, good luck and keep going. Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, as Fran and I leave you tonight, remember this. 
None of us get out alive. And we can only defeat ourselves. No one can defeat us. So live, love, laugh, be successful, and be a dreamer. And with that, I will say good evening until next Wednesday at 8 o'clock Eastern. Thank you again. Good night, everybody. Good night, Fran. Good night, Yvonne. When you visit the mills, it's more than outlet shopping. It's an adventure. Where else can you find the best brands, the best selection, and the biggest savings? The mills. Knockout brands, knockout prices. At Sawgrass Mills, discover our Florida resident special offer now through September 30th. Simply show your Florida ID at Simon Guest Services and receive a free coupon book with offers from more than 200 stores, including Kate Spade, New York, Bloomingdale's The Outlet Store, Swarovski, Seven for All Mankind, and Calvin Klein. Sawgrass Mills, a Simon Center. Center.